a quick update to a story that I did recently on a missing mother and her two-year-old daughter, Jennifer and Adriana Wicks, um, Robertson County, Tennessee. Jennifer and Adriana Wicks vanished 20 years ago. It was March of 2004 when Jennifer called her mother, sounding distressed. She told her and described to her an intense disagreement that she had had between herself and her boyfriend's parents with whom she was living at the time. She told her mother that if um, that she was planning to leave and come back to her home or to her aunt's home. The mother told her to let her know and um, she told her that she was going to speak to her boyfriend that evening and that she was considering leaving. But she never, she was never heard from again by her family. She did not contact her family, and her family began to call looking for her. And the man she was living with at the time was named Joey Benton, and they didn't answer her calls. They just, the family didn't answer her call, didn't answer her, Jennifer's family's calls when they were searching for her. But finally, after a few days, Joey Benton said that he dropped her off at a gas station and watched as she got into a white car. He couldn't give a description of the car or say, you know, he, he it was really a far-fetched story. For two decades, despite relentless searches, prior vigils, and fundraisers, and hiring private investigators and putting up billboards, Jennifer's family uncovered little information. However, on March the 27th, 2024, a break would come. A possible break. Twenty years to the day that they reported Jennifer and Adriana missing, law enforcement raided the Benton home. Neighbors and friends started vigorously calling um, Adriana, or Adriana and Jennifer's family, letting them know about this raid. They didn't know what was going on. They were trying to find out what the raid was about. Now, in the story that I did, I did talk a little bit about that and that the police said that it was unrelated to their disappearance. However, following the execution of a search warrant, the father of Joey Benton, Joseph Benton Sr., is now facing more than 40 charges of unlawful possession of dozens of weapons, explosives, and sexual exploitation of a minor. Court records say that they found a 20-year-old picture of a minor engaged in sexual activity. Benton was a felon following a previous assault conviction and was not allowed to have these weapons. While none of the charges were directly related to Jennifer and Adriana's disappearance, which has been reclassified as a homicide, they're no longer considered missing. They, the police have reclassified them as being dead and uh, murdered. Um, while the family has found out that the, this was not directly related to their disappearance, they are hopeful that because some of these charges are very severe and he could be looking at some very severe time in prison, that it could lead to leverage and maybe some information being, you know, released about what happened to Jennifer and Adriana. Now, in a startling turn, Joey Benton, this was the man who Jennifer was with at the time, agreed to meet with, now he was not the father, as far as it's my understanding that he was not the little girl's father. He agreed to meet with uh, Jennifer's sister, Casey, and her mother for the first time ever to sit down and have a conversation with them. She declined to give details about what they spoke about, fearing that it could compromise the investigation. But she did say the information about what happened to Jennifer and Adriana the day that they went missing was discussed. So apparently this Joey Benton came and talked to the sister and the mother and gave them some information, whether it's true or not, about what supposedly happened to the two of them, and even told them this, that, they could, that their remains were local, 
and that they would be able to find their remains. Casey said her family, along with the investigators, dug in multiple wooded areas over the last month. Now, this was back in March. However, they have found nothing so far. I feel like we're getting closer, she said. She also started producing a podcast, which is available August the 16th, called Missing in Hushtown. And she says that this will be available on all platforms, so you can look for that. So they begin to re-interview people from the past that might have had some information about this. And they say that people are a little bit more open to talk now that this man has been arrested. I think a lot of people were afraid of him. It was reported that he had he had a previous assault. And this is why he was a felon and was not supposed to be in possession of weapons. But there was also talk that he had sexually abused um other young females in his family. Now there's another story related to this about the arrest of this Joe Benton, Joey Benton, the Joseph Benton, the father. Authorities went to the property off of Owens Chapel Road in Springfield, Tennessee on March 27, 2024. Um, Joseph Benton was served with warrant for sexual exploitation of a minor after his property was raided by law enforcement. In addition for the warrant, warrant for sexual exploita exploitation, Joseph Frank Benton is now facing we uh, dozens of weapon charges in connection to violation of probation. This comes after he was arrested for domestic violence. Authorities from local, state, and federal offices scattered across his property. Um, he possessed a 20-year-old photograph in electronic form, which would be on a cell phone, a, a video, maybe a um, DVD or a computer type uh, electronic form that shows a minor engaged in sexual activity. Benton's arrest is raising eyebrows in the community because the same property was raided in a high-profile missing persons case. Jennifer and Adriana were staying there when they vanished 20 years ago. They vanished on March the 25th, 2004. Now this story is still developing and as of today I could find no more updates. But I'll continue to follow, and when the podcast comes out in a couple of weeks, I'm planning to um, listen and see what other information may come forward, anything new, and if it does, I'll do an update. So that was just a brief update that I wanted to bring on that story, and the only other thing I can say as far as updates go right now is the case of Amber Spradlin in Floyd County, Kentucky. I've made a couple of videos recently about her case, and as of today, as far as I know, as of last night, according to the Justice for Amber Facebook page, the father, Michael McKinney, had posted bond and is out of jail, but as of yesterday, that would have been Saturday, August the 3rd, both M.K. McKinney and Josh Mullins were both still in jail. Little bits and pieces are starting to come out now, and of course there's still a lot of speculation. It is rumored and talked about, and and not just rumor, I mean, let me take that word back, it is being discussed by people in the know that there probably could be some more charges brought against some other people for interference, for um, tampering with evidence, for helping cover this up. Um, the civil case, you may see a lot more about the officials out there that were involved. Now, a 911 call was made earlier in that several hours earlier, where it's my understanding that what was said on that call, which has, as far as I know, has not been released to the public, 
was that someone there was injured and bleeding and needed assistance. And before all the information was taken and, and you know, I don't know if this person gave their name and, uh, you know, I don't know who made that 911 call. People out there do know, people involved in this case know who made that call. And it will come out eventually and when the court proceedings begin. But someone made that call, and it was my understanding that Michael McKinney, the doctor, took the phone from them, got on the phone. I'm, I, I'm assuming that he told them who he was. I don't know if he did or not. But he just said, you know, there's just a misunderstanding. This person's okay. Everything's under control. We don't need any assistance from law enforcement or from an ambulance or EMTs or anything. And so no one went out. No one dispatched anyone to go out and just do a wellness check at the very least. And several hours later, this young woman is dead, murdered. And I don't know what their defense is going to be. A lot of people are speculating that they're going to try to throw one particular person under the bus and that this particular person who was supposedly a good friend of Amber, the, the murder victim, um, that he may possibly be used as the scapegoat by this family. I'm just speculating. Time will tell. I just wanted to throw this in there. I'm going to move on to my next story, which is actually a story that I was working on before all of these uh, update cases broke, before Amber Spradlin's update. So I'm going to get back to that. Thanks for watching.